Uh, I'm Stili Akkos Tendrus and today I'm talking about playfulness. This is more of a general lecture on playfulness, play, LARP, games, these kinds of issues. Uh, I'll start with the idea that play is older than humans. Uh, it is older than culture, it is older than language. Play is something that not only humans do, but many animals do. Basically all mammals play, and it is a slight exaggeration to say that if it has a spine, it plays, but that is only a slight exaggeration. Uh, animal uh, play scholars feel that even fish and uh, birds uh, engage in play, but animal play researchers also disagree on some of these things. Uh, so it's difficult for us laymen to comment on that, but let's take them on their word. So play is something that is very innate to us as biological organisms. It is something that is ingrained in us. It is a brute fact. It is something that exists regardless of a human culture or representations thereof. It is something that happens in all human societies and in most animals as well. In order for play to be this uh, widespread in the animal kingdom, according to the evolutionary theory, play must have an evolutionary benefit. Otherwise, it would have been weeded out at some point and it would not be as widespread as it is. So there must be some reason why play uh, is, uh, is exhibited in so many species. A number of theories have been presented on why play uh, happens. Uh, unfortunately, none of them are, are fully supported by evidence. The most commonly uh, encountered theory is that you learn while you play, but even that is, is up for debate. Uh, currently, our best theory is that uh, it's the so-called surplus resource theory of play uh, that connects to what is called adaptive variability, where the idea is that play is a similar social structure as uh, mutation is a genetic structure. So similarly, like mutation creates new things in the physical part of the organism, through play, uh, humans and other animals create different kinds of new interaction patterns, some of which will, be, will prove useful to the species as a whole. Play also uh, prepares us for the things we can't prepare for. The resource, uh, surplus resource theory of play basically says that uh, uh, for, in order for play to emerge, certain things need to be in place. I mean, even though play is something that, that m most animals with a spine are able to, to sort of, uh, participate in, it doesn't always emerge. So there are certain things that need to be in place for it to happen. There are four things. The first is energetics. Maj basically, it means that the organism, the, the animal needs to have enough energy to play. So if you're very hungry, if you're very tired, you will not play. Uh, the other one is onto ontogeny, situation where uh, protected from immediate threats. So if you are under duress, if you are fleeing for your life, if you are in a situation of a life and death situation, then you, there will be no play. So s play requires safety. Then there's the sort of the psychology and, and sociality uh, aspect of it, need for species, typ typical stimulation or uh, optimal arousal, meaning that different species play in different ways. Although both, animal, uh, both humans and, and fish play, we play in different ways. And finally, there's ecology, uh, varied lifetimes in complex environments. Even humans play differently in, uh, in a city than uh, and, and in, uh, in, in the countryside. When thinking about play, I find it very interesting to go and look at what the animal play researchers have been thinking about. Because often when we think about play uh, in humans, we, we either look at only children, or then we look at adults, and we don't consider the full spectrum of play. However, uh, sort of remembering that humans are just one species of animal can be beneficial in understanding the foundations of play. Uh, 
animal uh, play researchers divide play into three major categories. There is locomotor play, object play, and social play. Locomotor play is play with the body. For example, if, you, if a child jumps up and down, uh, it is, it, there is, a, there is a, a, a positive sensation in the body, or, uh, or if, you're, if, you're, if you go into an amusement park and you go on a roller coaster, the roller coaster sort of produces a feeling in your body which is, which is pleasurable, which is sort of play with the body. Also, things like masturbation go into this. You're playing with your body in a way that, is, uh, that doesn't serve an external goal, but is pleasurable and uh, uh, fun in itself. Then there's object play, where you play with something, with an object. For example, sort of you, you play with a stick, or you play with a ball, or you uh, play with a computer game. These objects can also be conceptual objects, so you can play with certain things in your mind as well. Uh, if, if you're, uh, well, if you have a larger brain than, than, say, a fish. Then there's social play, which is play with others. So th this is the play that takes place with other organisms, usually organisms of the same species, but it is also possible to engage in cross-species play. It is possible to play with a dog, for example, but there are certain limitations for that. But social play emerges when, uh, let's say that if we talk about humans, when a, a two humans are playing sort of the same play, they are engaged in the same activity, so they have a, an understanding that they are doing something together. There are other more complex uh, play forms. So these are the ones that are found, uh, and these are these are these are one way of, of of looking at the sort of the basic structures of play. In this picture here, this is I think from a Finnish uh, scout camp or something like that. Has all of those things. It has locomotor play. What the boys are doing is that they're do, they're doing tukki humala or or keppi kanni, where you have a stick and you go around it like this for long enough that you feel dizzy. So that's sort of your, 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 your going for the sensation in the body. It's also object play because you have the stick. And it's also social play because you do it with others because once you've sort of gotten yourself super dizzy, then you run and of course you're going to be veering it, trying to sort of st stand up upright. So this is an example of all of those uh, three uh, types of, of play. So obviously they can also be combined. And of course in LARP we have the body, we have objects or props and we have social play. But the thing that we most often forget is the locomotor play, the body of the player. In order to, when we st start to sort of uh, untangle uh, play, one of the things that I find interesting is separating play and playfulness. Uh, playfulness, as I understand it, is a subjective state of the player. It is something that happens in the mind of the player. You are in a playful mindset. You are sort of in your mind. You are playing, and uh, so then, what is that mindset in your in your head? One way to think about it is that we have two different meta motivational states, two different attitudes that we can take towards an activity. You can be in a playful mindset, or you can be in a goal oriented mindset. So, playful mindset is when you are doing something for the sake of doing it. And a goal-oriented mindset is when you are doing something for having it done. For example, if you are um, cleaning up your apartment, would you exchange the cleaning up for having a clean apartment? Or is the cleaning up of the apartment the thing that you want to do? Or similarly, if you are dancing, would you rather be dancing or already have that dance out of the way? So that's one way to sort of think about whether you're doing it for the sake of doing it or if you're doing it for an external purpose. So playfulness uh, uh, or, or uh, goal-oriented mindset. And this, is, uh, this, uh, this playfulness is something that happens inside the mind of the player. It, it may not be visible. It often is, but it is something that is, is, uh, happens within the player. Also, it has no moral dimension. Uh, being in a playful mindset isn't good or bad. It isn't uh, uh, evil or nice. It just, it, it's something that just happens. 
One way to look at this is, is that this comes from philosophy, uh, sorry, from psychology. Michael J. Apter has this um, uh, theory, reversal theory, where he talks about how we can reverse between uh, the playful mindset and the goal-oriented mindset, uh, and, and how in the, even if the situation changes exactly the same, our, our experience of it may change. So there's two lines. One of the, the, one, one, the, uh, the dotted line is, is uh, paratelic, which is playful mindset, and, and, the, and the continuous line is, is a goal-oriented mindset. So uh, in a situation where the felt arousal uh, is high, and the, the uh, uh, hedonic tone, sort of how does it feel pleasurable or not, both of these are high, then we are feeling excitement, whereas when we feel low arousal and it's unpleasant, that would be boredom. Uh, and, and the other alternative is that when we have a high arousal and a low uh, uh, enjoyment of it, then we have ex anxiety and uh, a, a high uh, pleasantness with low arousal would be uh, relaxation. One way to uh, exemplify what this means is, to, is to by an example of a tiger in a cage. If you encounter a tiger in a cage, the cage here is, is, is sort of a metaphor for the, uh, for, for the protective magic circle. That, that the fact that you're encountering the tiger is not dangerous, but it is fun. So if, you're, if you see a tiger in a cage, you are in a playful mindset, uh, and it's exciting. The tiger and the cage is exciting. But if you remove the cage, and you encounter just uh, the tiger, uh, then you, are, you, are, you switch from a playful mindset to a serious mindset, and that produces anxiety. However, if you encounter just uh, the, the cage, you're in a playful mindset and there's nothing there, you get boredom. And when there's no tiger and no cage, then maybe it's relaxing. Uh, so, sort of, we can switch between these, uh, these, this mindset. You can be in a playful mindset or, an un, uh, or, or a goal-oriented mindset in sort of any kinds of situation, and you cannot always tell from the situation which one it is. Uh, the things that are, uh, the w w one of the key things, however, if you're if you're working with trying to get get uh, people into a playful mindset, is to raise the arousal. We get excitement when we raise the arousal, as long as the people feel safe and there is sort of the metaphoric cage that we can be in a playful mindset. And according to Apter, there are certain things that usually work with humans. These are things that usually in humans increase arousal. Exposure to arousing stimulation, for example. For humans, this is, for example, a naked body or blood. These are things that tend to raise the arousal in a human. Fiction and narrative also do that. Challenge, if accepted, uh, as long as it's not too difficult. Exploration, if you encounter new territory, that raises arousal for, uh, and, the, and the evolutionary reasons why it's developed in this way is, is fairly easy to see here. Then another thing is negativism. If you do something you're not supposed to do, that usually raises arousal. Uh, it is exciting to do the things that you're not supposed to do. This is, this is how humans operate. Then there's a thing called cognitive synergy or bisociation, which is when you see uh, something in two different lights. For example, uh, uh, sort of jokes often work in, on, on this, this uh, uh, this uh, foundation that somebody says something, something and the joke is to understand the punchline in two different contexts. Somebody meant something, but it could be understood in an un another way. So if something is sort of true in two different frameworks, then that is cognitive synergy or bisociation and also increases arousal. Facing danger. Uh, also raises arousal. And then there are physiological interventions that we can do to raise arousal with, for example, certain drugs and alcohol. If we look at this from a LARP design point of view, it's interesting to note that many of these things are built into LARPs. I mean, there is, uh, there is fiction and narrative. There may be challenge. There's often exploration. Uh, adult play, playing as an adult, especially when you're doing it for the first time, I mean, this, there's a negativism because in our cultures the idea that adults play can be a little bit of a taboo. Uh, and then there's the cognitive synergy because you are encountering the situation both as a player, you're, you're seeing the situation both as a player and a character. 
and so forth. All right, that was playfulness. The other side is playing. Uh, if playfulness is something that happens in the mind of the player, then playing is something that is social. It refers to an action or an activity, something that actually happens by a person or between a number of people. It is vis visible. It can be carried out alone, but it can also be so uh, socially shared. It is usually rooted in a playful mindset, but once, you, once you've played something enough, a form starts to emerge. For example, uh, if, if sort of we start dancing here in a circle because we are excited and we dance for a little while and we dance for 20 minutes, uh, sort of it might not be as playful anymore. I can still continue doing it, pretend that I'm in a playful mindset, but actually I'm not anymore. I'm just doing it because obviously, apparently that's the thing we do at Ruta, we go around in circle. So sort of you can, you can take part in playing even if you're not in a playful mindset, because as long as, as soon as there is a form, there is something that uh, you participate in, for ex be, it a, be it a game of tag or a LARP or whatever, if there is a structure, if, if there, when there is a form, then you can, uh, you can also participate in, in a goal-oriented mindset. Ask anybody who works in a kindergarten. They, work, they, they play with kids every day, but that playing for them is usually very much work. It is, they're in a, often in a goal-oriented mindset. In our culture, uh, currently, play is often idealized and romanticized. There's this idea that play in itself is, is uh, is wonderful and nice. Sort of, you, you you get to be creative. Chil ch for children, play is their work. If you participate in sport, it builds character. There are many of these ideas that that play is wonderful, and and it's true. Play is wonderful, but that's not the whole picture of play. Play is also or can be dangerous, illegal, and disgusting. There's there's bad play, deep play, dark play, illicit play. Uh, sort of, uh, sort of, you can go drunk driving uh, on a dare, or you can have unprotected sex for kicks. I mean, there are all kinds of things that people do that they know they should, shouldn't do, but they still do because they're in a playful mind, mindset. They feel that they are safe, even if they are doing things that uh, uh, are unsafe. Similarly. Uh, Good and bad, legal and illegal are social constructs. So, so, so something that uh, is is by one culture or one part of the culture seen as as positive can be seen as negative by another culture. Another uh, another uh, view about playing that we have in our culture is that play is seen as deeply connected to creativity and culture. There is this idea that. Uh, creativity and innovation and improvisation and art are connected to play, and they are. Uh, but again, that is not the whole thing. Uh, play can be a wonderful creative space, but play is, is um, not just that. Uh, play can be also terrible and repetitive. Um, it can be compulsive. I mean, if you, once you've played 400 uh, different rounds of, of Candy Crush Saga, I mean, you can't really say that it's very creative or innovative or sort of creative of art. In humans, we still call repetitive play usually play, but, in the, but animal researchers, when they look at animals, they call them compulsions. If you have a very young cow, calf, uh, they do this thing with the, where they play with their tongues, but if you keep the cows in captivity, uh, the adult cows will will not be able to sort of leave that behind, and they compulsively will do the the tongue thing even when the cows are adults. And this is something that animal play researchers see as a compulsion. Uh, it is not something they voluntarily do, but it is something that sort of they can't leave behind. Now, I am not saying that Candy Crush Saga is the same thing, but I'm also not, not saying that it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, then, uh, one thing that I also want to put out there is that play has no function. P 
clay like life has no function. It doesn't exist for a specific purpose. It does not serve a purpose. Uh, it, there is no innate function to it. A screwdriver has a function. It has been designed by humans with the intention that it will be used for a certain thing. Play in itself in organisms does not have a function. However, we can assign function to play. We can, we can decide that this play that we are now going to engage in will be for learning. And this LARP that we are now going to play, we are doing to have fun. And this uh, LARP we are now setting up, uh, we are setting it up as art so that we can gain status in the art world, for example. So there can be different assigned functions that we assign to, to, to play, but play in itself does not come in, built in, with a function like a screwdriver. And there are cultural understandings of what play is, and it varies from country to country and from era to era. But there is, there is no built-in uh, function. So to, to uh, uh, sum up thus far, uh, sort of playfulness is a brute fact. It's something that exists in animals. Humans are animals. We are playful in certain ways that are expressed. The playfulness is sort of is something that happens in the mind of the participant. And then when you get people together being playful, certain forms can start to emerge so that there is playing. And that playing is something that once a form has, has come about, it's possible to engage in play activity even if you are not in a playful mind. Mindset. And then we have cultural ideas of what is play, which may change over time. Now, since it's possible to be in a playful mindset even when you are not, even when, since it is possible to be in a playful mindset even when you are participating in play, it's also possible to be in a playful mindset when you are not participating in something that would be seen as play. So when you're in a playful mindset and playing, that's sort of classic play. When you're not playing, when you're in a goal-oriented mindset in something that is not seen as play, then it's obviously not play. But then we have the gray areas. When you are participating in playing or in a game, for example, but you are in a goal-oriented mindset, that would be called instrumentalized play. For example, when you use play forms to teach something. That could be a goal-oriented instrumentalization. Or if we think about professional athletes, people who get paid to play ice hockey, uh, then, then we talk about instrumentalized play. Uh, then uh, there are sort of, it's possible also to be playful in a, in, in, in a setting that is not supposed to be playful. For example, if you're skateboarding on a street, a street is not meant to be a playful sp space, at least not always. So you are sort of appropriating that space for play. Or for example, if you're sitting in a super boring meeting and you want to entertain yourself and you decide that you will add um, to every uh, point on a slide or every sentence that somebody says you add at the end in bed and then you're just sort of making fun in your mind and sort of sort of appropriating that meeting for your own pleasure in bed. <laughs> so then we come to LARPs and games and toys and other things. So all these things that we have that are built on play, they are tools for play. So th these are certain, some things that we use to play. We have all kinds of social, materially instrumentalized playfulness, like games is the most obvious example. Uh, and in games, they can be either artifacts or activities. So the, the idea of, of uh, running, uh, 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 running competition or doing tag or hide and seek, but also artifacts like like Monopoly box or Carcassonne or things like this. But we have other things also. We have toys, uh, playgrounds, puzzles, sports simulations, but also things that are s sort of incomplete that invite you to do something like sport equipment, art supplies, costumes, masks. These all in invite play. And if we get further away, sort of more conceptual level, we can talk about rituals, tools, fictions, competitions, performances that somehow uh, invite play. Now LARP, LARP is instrument, institutionalized play in the sense that we have, we have uh, 
uh, uh, constructed together the rules and we share those rules and we share an understanding of how it's supposed to be. We treat it as play and we will be playing, but there is a, there is a sort of a context uh, and, and a system that we are using when we are playing. It's sort of a ludic system. I'm using ludic. I'm, I'm going to Latin so that I don't use the forbidden word here. Uh, <laughs> So how do we then, how do we institutionalize play? How do we get to a LARP? Uh, how do we build it uh, together? How do we build the system uh, mm, of rules? Basically, there are three parts. First, we have constitutive rules. When we start LARPing, uh, there are certain rules that we need to follow. And here, the most obvious example comes from games. Sort of how do our games constructed? They're constructed with rules. For example, football doesn't make any sense unle un unless you follow the rules. In fact, if you do not follow the rules of football while playing football, you are not playing football. These rules constitute the activity. Saving that spherical thing from going into that net only makes sense if we all follow the rules that constitute this activity. And this is basically the same for LARP. If we don't follow the rules, it might be nonsensical uh, what, it, what we are doing. The other thing is collective intentionality, which is also talked of as inter-immersion. The idea here is that, is that sort of when we start doing these things, we need to do them together. It's not sort of us doing similar things side by side, but it is something we are doing together as a group, sort of we intentionality. My doing something only makes sense in the context of you doing the same thing. And this is basically the same thing in the animal kingdom when you have a pack of animals hunting. They are not hunting individually, they are hunting as a collective. So this is again something that is built into us. So for example, if I start pretending that I am Conan the Barbarian, it will be ridiculous. But if all of you pretend with me that I am Conan the Barbarian, then maybe it will start to feel real and maybe we, we'll, we'll get somewhere. Maybe, maybe not Conan the Barbarian for me, but you get the idea. Uh, and then the third one is assignment of function which means that sort of, sort of we, uh, we assigned a meaning to the thing that we do. And this works on a number of levels. Uh, for example, we assign a meaning to a paper that this is money and this is worth 10 pounds. And we agree that in this LARP that is what happens. But on the, that, that, and that's how we build the rules within, within the fiction. But also, we may assign function to the whole LARP, that this LARP is for fun, this LARP is for education, this LARP is for exploration, this LARP is for getting funding, I mean, whatever re thing we are, we, are, we are doing. And then we can also build a power structure within the fiction so as to who gets to decide within the LARP how do we assign function, what is uh, what becomes real within the fiction. For example, usually the LARP organizers have much more power within the LARP as to, uh, as to what is real there, whereas the uh, player participants can, for example, decide what is real in their characters. They, well, how do they uh, communicate there? So LARPing has a basis in play, but players need not be in a playful mindset while they are playing. It is possible to be in a goal-oriented mindset when you are playing. If the function of LARP is to be entertaining, at least on some level, then encouraging playfulness is a good idea because that is something that people usually enjoy. And I think LARP as a form is quite playful. Uh, many of the methods that Apter listed to raise arousal, for example, function here. One thing also that we could no note is that seriousness and playfulness are not its, op its opposites. You can be sort of seriously playful as well. So these are these they don't cancel each other out. They are not at the other ends of the fader, but can it, can coexist. So it is possible to have serious play. And uh, I mentioned in the beginning that there are three types of, uh, of sort of locomotor play, social, uh, locomotor play, object play, and social play. We have two more which, uh, that I often come up with, which are pretend play and rule play. Pre pretend play is basically pretend to be something you're not, acting as if 
which is of course the foundation of role playing. So again, it is a foundational way of playing. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can try to communicate the instruction you are a secret agent to someone without using any terminology relating to pretending. It is a little bit difficult. And of course, rule play, play with rules, uh, is something that is also important in, in uh, LARP. So the power of play is, th is also that it is perceived often culturally as just play. When we are uh, engaging in an activity that looks like play, we can get away with things that we might not be able to get away with otherwise. So play also generally acts as an alibi. And another thing about play is that play makes rules explicit. Uh, the three rules for building a LARP uh, uh, constitutive rules, assignment of function, and uh, collective in intentionality are the exact same rules that we use to construct the social reality in which we are. So the same ways we build our fictions are the same ways we build the social reality in which we uh, are every day. And when looking at LARP, we may be able to become better at perceiving how those power structures function. All right. I think that pretty much concludes what I had to say today. Uh, I could go on about play and playfulness for a long while. If you're interested in this stuff, you can find out more online. Thank you.